Hello there, it's Jay here from Jay's Vintage Junk, and today I thought we'd take have a look at this. Um, what we've got here, now this is a Eagle Products um, model TE188 um, signal generator. Now this was a donation from uh, Gadget UK. He, I think someone donated to him a pile of old computer stuff, and in amongst it was this and a, um, a strange black box which he um, also sent me that I did a mini tear down quite a while ago, a couple of years ago now. I've had this in storage for um, quite some time, I've never uh, actually done anything with it. Uh, but I'm still waiting on a couple of bits to get on with the um, apricot project. Um, I've lost my little fiberglass brush, I haven't got a foggiest what I've done with it so I had to order a, um, another one, I can't really carry on and do some of the clean up work I need to do on that until that arrives but it should be here next couple of days anyway so um, I dug this off the shelf I thought I'd finally um, get around to having a quick look at it it's quite an interesting little um, signal generator really um, these were aimed at the cheaper end of the market um, I think, I mean I've not looked precisely but I think it dates from late 60s but I think I believe these were still you know, for sale in the back of magazines into the 70s um, like I said, they were really from the cheaper end of the market uh, they were made in Japan and they were aimed at sm you know, small little independent repairers and perhaps you know, your more affluent hobbyist of the time uh, they were certainly a lot cheaper than the competition which would have been something like ooh, and the weight difference is also very apparent something like this um, this is an advanced um, signal generator uh, UK made uh, it's slightly earlier um, than the Eagle products one although we, the Eagle products they did actually make um, signal generators back when this was made which was early and probably around 62, 63, around that kind of era I believe this was made. Uh, it could have been very very late 50s but I don't think so, I think this one was actually um, early 60s. Um, but these were prohibitively expensive, you know you had to be quite like a decent sized service centre or um, if you are like a little independent one man band shop you're one that's got a hell of a turnover or obviously you're in a very affluent area or something. Um, something like this was just basically it was a cheaper option it does the same job um, in fact actually this does um, this does something that that um, advanced one can't do um, one of the reasons why I'd actually quite like to get this um, up and running um, but like I said weight wise it, it weighs probably under half what that advanced one weighs um, it's still and yeah, you know, it's still quite nice. Obviously, um, we still have a um, graduated tuning scale there. It's just simpler. Um, we don't quite have quite as many um, controls, but we've got everything we need. They are both uh, RF and AF signal generators, as in they will produce um, an audio frequency um, signal for testing the um, audio frequency parts of um, radios they will also um, produce a um, RF signal for testing and aligning the radio frequency parts of receivers um, they uh, both have that ability and um, there's nothing really much different in that respect um, quick look over it looks like it's not been used in a very very long time uh, we can pretty much um, assume that by the fact that it's still got a, um, a 2 amp I think it's either a 2 amp or a 5 amp I can't quite make it oh it's a, yeah it's a 5 amp um, it's a 5 amp UK round pin plug on it now um, just by the fact it's still got that on it um, is an indication this thing's probably not been switched on since I'd say at the very very latest probably the 1980s um, I think the last time I actually saw one of these type of plugs actually in service in a house 
where it was still actually being used would have been in the um, early 1980s at my grandmother's. Um, I mean, that got rewired probably in about 86 or 87. Um, prior to that, that still had plugs like that, so that you know they were well out of um, well out of fashion by then. So I don't think this thing's been used in um, a very, very long time. Uh, what I have done, we'll have a quick look inside it. What I, what I would like to do on this video, I'm not going to actually restore it on this video or anything, because it's going to be quite, probably quite an involved process. I would like to get this into full working order at some point. But um, what I'd quite like to do is we'll have a look inside it, see what state it's in inside. And uh, then we might actually have a look, see if we can make it safe enough that we can actually do a power up on it and see if it does actually still function okay. Um, so, I have actually cheated slightly on this video, I um, just before I started, I have actually whipped all the screws out from the front of it, because there is quite a few that hold the front plate um, in place around there, so I have just whipped them out previously and just stuck them in that bag there. But what I haven't done is taken taken those ones out so we can um, actually get the radio out of the case. We'll whip them out now. And we'll put them in that little bag so we don't lose anything. This is actually nice that it's got all its original screws. It doesn't actually look like it's been really messed about with. We'll have a look inside and see if it looks like there's been any hackery done to it. Okay. Now, unfortunately, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove that, um, I'll remove that plug because we're not going to be using it. This is a lovely Bakelite plug that. But we'll take that off. My little screwdriver. Where's my little screwdriver gone? Ah, there you go, little screwdriver. We'll whip that off and then we can um, get rid of the back for now. So I will find a use for them, for them one day. There we go. We can get the back, the back out completely. A bit of um, very dry rubber there. I'm feeling what that, that was probably a, a little rubber grommet uh, around where the cable goes through there to stop it chafing. So we will have to address that. We're going to have to change that cable anyway because that cable is not up to UK standards. I mean, I'm not one up. I'm not one for having everything up to the latest standard. But even I wouldn't use this. It's um, two core, um, single insula singly insulated. You've no double insulation on it. Um, all it has to do is basically chafe there, and um, it could potentially make the whole unit live. Um, we will be changing it. Like I said, when I do look at actually fully restoring this, we will be changing. Um, we'll be changing that for a new mains cable. Whether we use a two core or three core yet depends on what we find with the actual um, signal generator. Um, it will. Well, I can see we've got a, a nice big mains transformer there, so it does look like it's an AC um, circuit. However. Um, especially this being Japanese, um, they were very cheaply built um, and they sometimes used what's... It's an AC set but it's not an isolated AC set. Uh, basically what they did is they only used a mains transformer to run the filaments for the valves and they derived the um, HT directly off the mains. Um, you cannot earth um, the chassis on a set in that configuration. 
Uh, with luck, um, we'll have a double wound uh, mains transformer here with a high, a high tension tap in and a filament tap in. And we will indeed be able to um, add an earth, put a new cable on with an earth so it's fully grounded. Um, but we can look into that anyway. Let's see what we got, we're using valve wise. With this being, again, this being a Japanese set, um, it probably doesn't use valves that we're um, too familiar with. In fact, we can look straight out there, we have, that's a little uh, miniature, the B7A, uh, yeah, it's the uh, miniature 7 pin, and it's a um, 6AR5. Now, I, my memory serves me correctly. Um, that's actually an output, an audio output um, valve. Um, not really used much in the UK. Um, I don't know about the US. Um, if my memory serves me correctly, because um, I have played about with them, it's very, very similar to the old um, 6V6s, uh, big um, glass 6V6s, the pre-war um, 1940s. Um, output of pentodes, only shrunk down into a little uh, miniature valve there. I think a nearest equivalent would be something like um, an EL91, EL92, something like that. They're a similar thing where it's actually quite a large um, power output valve that's been miniaturised into a little, um, far, a little uh, miniature pentode like that. Um, that's quite a beefy belt quite a beefy valve I think it's good for a couple of watts at least um, in single um, in a single output valve like that rather than being used in push-pull I think they're good for about four or five watts in push-pull um, so I presume that's being used to drive the um, have we got another out that's the mains transformer ah yeah we've got a little output transformer there so that'll be for the um, audio output for the AF side of it. Let's see what the other valve is. We've all got these nice little um, valve uh, retainers on them. It's, like I say, it, these were cheap units but it's very nicely built. You've got to say that. It's quite nicely put together. Let's get this out. That's didn't want to come out of its socket and what have we got here and the valves they are uh, Toshiba brand they are both Toshiba brand and this is I'm having a little bit of difficulty uh, reading that ah here we are it's a 12 B That's really, really difficult to... Let me see if I can find my glasses, because it's really difficult to read the printing on that. There we go, that's uh, better. It's a 12BH7A, I think. Yeah, that looks like it. It's a 12BH7A. Again, if I remember correctly, um, it's... I think it's a um, double triode. Just looking at the actual makeup of the valve, I think it's a double triode. Um, I believe these are something similar. In fact, if I remember uh, reading about these, um, it's got the same pin out of something like an ECC81 or ECC83. Um, but I don't believe the characteristics are exactly the same. But uh, yeah, it's basically just a, um, a double triode. So is that being used as the oscillator? Um, obviously when we get into this thing a bit deeper, what I'll have to do is I'll have to actually dig out a circuit um, a circuit diagram for it. Hopefully we can find a circuit diagram for it. Now I also believe that these other companies bought these and rebranded them under their own names so um, we may be able to find some data about one like I said that's basically one of these that's just been rebranded um, I did have a quick look online but I couldn't unfortunately I couldn't find very much I found a bit of data about one um, but the, 
machine. It did you? I think it. Ble I believe it did you actually use exactly the same valves as this, uh, but it was a completely different design of machine. It was like an upright kind of unit there with the dial at the front and the controls down at the bottom, and it, a completely different um, model number on it and everything. Um, I will see if I can dig that. I mean, the circuit may be very, very similar actually, because I don't think they would have changed the circuit all that much. So it has the same um, graduated scale as my um, my more expensive one. Uh, it just feels that little bit cheaper. You know, it's not as accurate. It's not as fine a um, tuning on it, but it does the job. You know, it does work okay. Um, does tune okay. Now let's see if it is indeed. Um, and that's nice to see, right? Yeah, it does look like we do have double isolation. Um, we've got two um, secondaries on here. We've got the white wires here are the primaries for the mains transformer. Uh, the red wires are our secondary high tension, and the blue wires are our secondary uh, low tension to run the to run the filaments. I think. Think it looks like it got yeah because that's going over to that valve there. It's going through there. That's ground to there, is it? Yeah. And we have a solid state rectifier there. So our high tension comes out into that rectifier, out of that rectifier, and it will go into. We've got some smoothing capacitors here. We've got some filter capacitors and some smoothing capacitors. What have we got there? Um, 10 microfarad, uh, um, 180 working volts. So the HT mustn't be very high on this. In fact, what we may have to do. Now I'm hoping this is uh, designed for UK mains voltage. Yes, yes, it's 220. Well, when I say UK mains voltage, uh, one of the other problems with um, like this stuff that come um, from Japan and the, mid the Far East, um, they tended to make the stuff to a European specification rather than a um, UK specification back then. And Europe ran on 220 volts, is where we've, well, at the time we had multiple voltages in the UK up to the late 60s, the last of that kind of fizzled out, and we all settled on um, 240 volts. So there is a 20 volt um, difference there. Um, it doesn't usually make a whole heap of difference, uh, but it is something you have to be aware of. Uh, when we first power this thing up, obviously we're going to have to measure and uh, monitor some of the voltages. Make sure none of them are um, too ridiculous, um, especially like on that smoothing capacitor. We don't want to over voltage um, the smoothing capacitor. Uh, we don't want to put too much voltage on the filaments of the um, valves either. Um, that's equally as bad because you um, risk overrunning the valves. But I can't see anything here that looks terrible. Um, in fact, it all looks pretty good. With none of the rubberized wiring that tends to degrade and start cracking. This is all plastic wiring. It all feels in reasonable condition still. Um, these disc ceramic capacitors very, very, very rarely ever go wrong. They shouldn't be a problem. But high stability um, ceramic resistors as well. Now these Illy brand um, capacitors I have heard in the past that these can be a little bit pro uh, problematic. They do tend to go um, leaky. I'm not sure about the um, other Illibrand capacitors, it's the electrolytic ones um, I believe can cause problems. I'm not so sure about the um, film type. Like, I don't know whether these are actually a film type capacitor or whether they're just a, um, 
a paper and foil capacitor in a, a more modern kind of packaging. But we can test that out. So there's very little to this really. I've got another of those capacitors there. Um, they could do, I mean especially like that one, that's um, that's isolating the um, AF input and output from the rest of the circuit, so that's you know, a reasonable safety critical component. Um, I've got some more in here which we'll just, basically we'll just have to check. Um, people have said that they can be a little bit problematic some of these um, older Japanese capacitors. I'm just seeing if I can see any um, date on them actually can't so far. No, it just says um, Japan. Ico electric capacitor. Now what I think we'll do, I can't see anything here that looks really really bad. Um, I think what we're going to do is just do a quick first test of it actually. We'll power it on and um, see what it actually does. See whether um, it's actually going to power on safely or not. What I'll do, we're not just going to plug it straight into the mains and see what happens. I've got my, um, I've got my safe block here. I've also got a bulb and we're going to put this in series um, with the unit just just as for initial power up um, just in case something is shorted in here there's a fault in here um, this will prevent any further damage it's just peace of mind like literally just peace of mind for the um, first power up being the fact that we don't really know really what condition this thing's in get a meter and we can measure the um, HT as we bring this thing up pause you while I dig some leads out and we can get a um, couple of meters set up so back in a sec okay we've got the um, meter here basically connected to the main smoothing capacitor there um, so that's going to monitor what HT we get um, produced now this won't immediately produce um, the full HT that the sets um, meant to be seeing because we're going to use this um, light bulb as a uh, limiter, uh, basically a a current limit just in case there is something um, nasty it will also, if that capacitor is really poorly um, farmed, it will just limit the inrush current into the capacitor being that we don't have a valve rectifier, it's using a, um, a solid state rectifier um, if we didn't do that and that capacitor was um, very poorly farmed, all that's going to happen is that's going to heat up immensely. So what we will do, we'll take the safe block and we're going to connect one side of my light bulb to the live on the safe block what we need to do we need another meter um, just bear with me a sec and I'll just find my um, other test meter okay we've got another meter and we've also got my continuity buzzer here so that's it because what we want to do is we want to determine 
which of these two wires goes straight to the transformer and which of these two wires goes through the switch. So we hold that on there, not that one. It's that one. So we want to connect that one there to the neutral. And pull this out because we're not going to be reusing this cable when we restore the radio. We can get that to the neutral on the safe block. And the other wire we put well out of harm's way because this will be live. We basically connect those two together like that. We can put that somewhere that's well out of harm's way. Plug in the safe block. And close the safe block up. So we've got to be just very careful that wire there is live, even though it is running through the uh, lamp limiter there. Right. Keep this handy because we can use this for just checking um, checking some voltages. In fact, what I could do with, if I could find it, get that lead. I should have another um, clip lead with an alligator clip on one side. here but it's the wrong um, colour. Let's see where we've just got a clip on one lead and in fact we can use that we'll just have to pretend it's black. So we can connect that up. We'll connect that on we'll set that to um, DC volts. We'll put that meter there and we'll connect that to ground. Or to the chassis. Like that. And that will allow us to just check some of the voltages on some of these capacitors and actually see if we've got any leakage going through um, through the capacitors. Like I say, I'm not that sure about them. Um, well, the uh, Lily uh, brand capacitors. I have. I think it was Shango was talking about them in some of the sets that he's um, repaired. It's not um, something that we really see in the UK, but I believe that they were using stuff that was sold in the US as well as Japan. I mean, the US did get a lot of imports of the cheaper end Japanese stuff um, before we really did. Um, so we're about ready to do um, a first power up. I think we'll. Yeah, we've got the on switch there. Let me just find my glasses so I can see properly. Okay, so what we'll do, um, we've got the safe block down, we've got the lamp in series, we'll switch on, safe block's energised, so basically now when I turn the switch there that'll power the, um, power the frequency generator up and we should see a voltage on here and we don't want to see any over, anything over really um, 180 volts because that will be um, putting too much onto the smoothing capacitor there so uh, we'll switch on and neon's lit obviously, obviously we are going through the safety lamp there and we're up to it's slowly rising but we're just under a hundred volts there. But we can show that with the um, other meter. 
and I just um, one hand only. Just touch my meter on there. Yeah, we've got 100 volts there. So what that does mean is we can just have a quick check round and see what we've got on some of these um, capacitors. There shouldn't be anything on this side. That's fine. This side. That's not showing anything. All I'm looking for really is stray DC on any of these um, any of these capacitors, and so far I'm not actually seeing anything. That's not looking too bad. Have a look here. I've got 132 coming out of the. Um, solid state rectifier hundred and thirty three so that's well under what that um, capacitor is rated at so far nothing seems to be looking like it's getting hot or anything I can't smell anything that smells bad That voltage is just very, very slowly creeping up, so I think that um, that capacitor is just slowly reforming. In fact, what I'm going to do, I think that capacitor is just um, slowly coming up. As you can see, the voltage is very, very slowly rising. So what's happening there is, is um, the current consumption of that capacitor drops basically because you've got the uh, current limiter there that will go dim and basically that's not it that's only pulling a few volts now and that will take less current as that there basically uh, reforms I'll probably end up changing these yeah if you can look there 135 volts on it now so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a good probably 20 minutes or so just sitting at this lower voltage. We're not really going to damage anything. Um, and then I'm going to um, basically connect it back up without the uh, limiter in place. So we can give it the full mains and we'll just have a quick check on some of them um, capacitors. Make sure nothing's getting hot. Make sure there's no nasty voltages anywhere we don't want to see them. And... Um, then we'll actually have a look, see if we can actually see if this thing will um, function as it should do. So, uh, back in a sec. Okay, I had it on for about 20 minutes, um, just like that. And no nasty smells, no burning or anything. The smoothing capacitor there just got very, very slightly warm to the touch. Not hot at all, just very slightly warm to the touch. So, I am going to basically, uh, well, take the um, current limiter out of circuit we'll show it the full mains and we'll just see what we get on the um, smoother capacitor there if that's okay um, I might just stick it loosely back in its case and uh, we'll fire it up and we'll just see um, whether it functions or not that's going to be okay there we've switched off that we'll disconnect that there we'll take that out of the way Connect that to the safe, straight to the safe block like that. We're off there for now, so we can shut that. We'll switch on there. And then when I switch on here, we'll give it the full mains, and we'll just see whether everything's okay. Now, obviously, we've come up slightly higher on the um, HT there. We'll just test it with this. But there we go, I mean, that's not bad, 136 volts, I said the capacitor is rated at um, 180 volts, so we're still well under 
where we should be so there's no nasty smells, no smoke or anything we'll switch off and we'll disconnect everything in fact what I'll do is I'll just quickly pause the video, I'll get this loosely back into its case and then we'll actually have a look and see whether the um, unit is actually going to function. Like I say, I'm reasonably confident to um, power this thing up now. Um, obviously it's not in a safe condition. Um, it will not be in a safe condition until the, uh, the mains cable is replaced. And if I want to put this thing into actual service rather than just having it sat on a shelf and occasionally just demoing it, um, I will probably have to change most of these capacitors uh, just for longevity because I'm pretty sure even if they're working at the moment um, if I put this thing into actually hard service uh, these caps are going to start to fail uh, but for the moment we'll be fine just um, using it just to actually see whether the unit does indeed um, function so uh, back in a sec okay I've got it loosely screwed back together I haven't both put in all the screws back round the side, I've just put the two in the back to hold it on. That is quite actually, actually quite important when you're testing something like a signal generator because it can actually affect the way that this thing works uh, not having it in the case. Um, basically you've got an oscillator in here. Um, essentially it's like a little um, miniature transmitter and it's got oscillations wanting to get out. Uh, the actual metal case does kind of like keep that in and keep it um, so it's not spewing out um, unwanted um, RF really but first thing I think we'll do is just see whether the AF side of it works so with that in mind I went and just grabbed a random speaker out of my um, speaker collection we'll put that down there uh, we'll need a couple of leads to um, connect this up in fact we can use um, the leads out of my uh, tester here, these should fit. Put that back up there. Have we... Oh, I hope I'm I don't think that's going to fit. Let's try these ones. Well that one fits, so at least we can use that for the ground. We'll connect that up. Like that find just a normal crop lead. Well, that might work. Yeah that works. We'll connect that to the other side. Like that. Now if we switch on. Let the thing warm up. I don't need to bother about that because that's RF output. It's this is the one that we're. Oh, we don't seem to be getting anything. Now I'm pretty certain that speaker does work. So we should be basically we should be hearing a tone coming out of the speaker at this point that should change as we tune across the frequencies there. That shouldn't make any difference for the that's the modulation switch for external or internal modulation. Do not seem to be getting um, any AF output from it at all. In fact, let me just go and see if I can find a different speaker just in case it is this um, speaker that's no good. So, uh, back in a sec. Okay, I've gone and got another speaker, and I know this one works 100%. So, we know that's a good speaker. So let's just try this again. It could have been that that speaker is bad. 
that is making good enough contact yeah and that's making good enough contact there so let's connect it up this time and let's just try again Now the valve should warm up reasonably quick in this for the simple fact that it's got um, a solid state rectifier. And we don't seem to be getting anything there. I don't think that should make any difference. Nor should the RF output. So we don't seem to be getting any AF um, activity on it. I wonder if we're getting any um, RF output on it. What I'll do, switch off. So we've obviously, it looks like we've got a fault on the um, AF section. We could have a bad output transformer. Um, all sorts of different things. It could be the output valve itself, although I wouldn't expect it to be completely dead if the output valve was, you know, getting a little bit tired. It'd just be weak. Uh, the fact we're getting absolutely no activity at all. That's um, that's. It could, like I said, it could be that we've got a bad um, audio output transformer. Um, I will have to dig out the circuit for this thing, and um, we'll have a proper look at that. Um, Let's quickly see if we've got any um, activity on the um, RF output. And with that in mind, let's use some cheap, ju some cheap um, junk from Hong Kong. Now, back when I was a kid and I first got into messing with radios, this was the, actually the cheapest, cheapest way of getting parts to play with. Uh, these radios were for sale in a um, shop local to me. Um, I'm not sure when they were actually made. I think they were possibly made in the 1970s. But this was in the very early 1990s. Uh, this shop, it just sold tat, basically. And they used to sell these radios for one pound fifty. Like I said, this was in about 1990, 1991, when I first really started getting really into playing with um, stuff like this. And for £1.50, this is what you got. These are Arrow Solid State um, Pocket Radios. And you've got your radio, and you've got a little headphone um, like that. And they do work just about this room I don't get very good reception I think the battery is failing a little in this one but unfortunately because of all the lights and everything it's not really picking up but what this should do this has got about a 470 kilohertz um, IF on it now we should be able to get this if this um, signal generator working. We should be able to get it to um, be picked up on this radio if we tune the signal generator over the IF frequency of the radio. Uh, what we'll do is we'll just loosely couple. We're going to the low. Okay, we'll get into that one. Oh yeah, there we go. We'll go into the low input of the um, RF output on the signal generator. And we'll just loop it round the radio like that. We'll switch on. Right, we're on internal modulation. And we want to be... Band B... There we go. That's the IF 
So, interestingly, the IS. Turn that off. But it does appear that the um, the RF side of this uh, signal generator is actually working. There we are. I can't find it where it is now. But it does look like the um, RF side of it's not dead. About, I think we're about there. So that's basically us just turn that radio off now. So, it does look like we do have a fault in the AF um, side of this um, radio, of this um, signal generator, but like I say, it looks like we do have life in the RF stage. So it is going to need, basically this thing's going to need a full um, restoration. It would be nice, actually I would like to get this one um, working. For one simple reason. It's a, it's a little bit dodgy, but I don't, I don't have a nefarious uh, purpose for the use. But, unlike that advance that I showed at the start of the video, the signal generator can essentially work as a small radio transmitter in the the AF input there um, sorry the AF output there can also be an input that's what this exterior and interior modulation means basically if you turn it to exterior modulated like that and you feed an audio signal into the AF there and you set your frequency you get a modulated RF output. Now, if we use the low output at the bottom there and we just use a little piece of wire like you just showed me there, it's going to transmit a foot or two. That's absolutely fine and that's what I intend to um, use it for. It'd be a nice way of feeding signals to some of my um, AM radios every now and again. Um, the high output on this, the, the issue you've got really is the high, because this uses quite powerful valves, I mean, uh, like I said, that output valve is equivalent to a 6V6, um, and that will probably be being used to generate the RF as well as the AF. Um, like I said, I will have to dig the circuit diagram out for this so we can have a proper look at that. Um, this thing's got the potential if you put a long wire aerial on there to be able to transmit a fair old distance, really. Um, I'm actually wondering why these things were really allowed in the country uh, because back when this was made um, the FCC, uh, the British version really um, what was it? Um, it's, it, was, it was under some weird um, department in the government the DTI, uh, Department of Trade and Industry uh, was over regulation of like radio frequencies and stuff and they cracked down on basically anything that could transmit um, that wasn't really meant to be able to transmit yet these things seem to have um, crept into the country like I say I have no intention of um, doing anything um, slightly dodgy with it um, apart from possibly using the low um, power output to um, modulate a signal to feed some of my um, AM radios and using it for its intended purposes as a um, signal generator but it is interesting like I said I will not now because I, I do want to get back onto the um, apricot because I really want to get that apricot up and running um, but I think we will revisit this we'll try and figure out why the um, AF output isn't working on it uh, we'll probably will end up replacing some of those capacitors. We'll test the valves in it, make sure the valves are still um, in good condition. They could pose a little bit of a problem. Um, not so much the um, output valve, because I'm pretty sure I could substitute that for various other things. 
but the double triode, like I said, I know it's pin compatible with the uh, like the ECC81, the ECC83, things like that, but I believe the characteristics are slightly different. And because that's being used as the oscillator, at least I, I believe that's probably being used as the oscillator in here, um, changing that valve for something else could actually affect frequencies and we have to go into trying to realign things and apart from the other advanced signal generator I've got, like I say, I don't really have the equipment to um, go in and do all that accurately, so um, fingers crossed that at least that um, that valve's in um, good working order, like I say, I'm not as, as um, cons okay, I've got, I've got another speaker, I know this one works 100% so we know that's a good speaker Let's just try this again. It could have been that that speaker is bad. That is making good enough contact. Yeah, and that's making good enough contact there. So let's connect it up this time and let's just try again. Now the valve should warm up reasonably quick in this for the simple fact that it's got um, a solid state rectifier. And we don't seem to be getting anything there. I don't think that should make any difference. Now should the RF output. So we don't seem to be getting any AF um, activity on it. I wonder if we're getting any um, RF output on it. What I'll do, switch off. So we've obviously, it looks like we've got a fault on the um, AF section. We could have a bad output transformer. Um, all sorts of different things. It could be the output valve itself, although I wouldn't expect it to be completely dead if the output valve was, you know, getting a little bit tired. It'd just be weak. Uh, the fact we're getting absolutely no activity at all. That's, um, that's it could, like I said, it could be that we've got a bad um, audio output transformer. Um, I will have to dig out the circuit for this thing, and um, we'll have a proper look at that. Um, Let's quickly see if we've got any um, activity on the um, RF output. And with that in mind, let's use some cheap some cheap um, junk from Hong Kong. Now, back when I was a kid and I first got into messing with radios, this was actually the cheapest cheapest way of getting parts to play with. Uh, these radios were for sale in a um, shop local to me. Um, I'm not sure when they were actually made. I think they were possibly made in the 1970s. But this was in the very early 1990s. Uh, this shop, it just sold tat, basically. And they used to sell these radios for £1.50. Like, so this was in about 1990, 1991, when I first really started getting really into playing with um, stuff like this. And for £1.50, this is what you got. These are Arrow Solid State um, Pocket Radios. And you've got your radio, and you've got a little headphone um, like that. And they do work just about this room I don't get very good reception I think the battery is failing a little in this one but unfortunately because of all the lights and everything it's not really picking up but what this should do this has got about a 470 kilohertz um, IF on it now we should be able to get this, if this um, signal generator is working, we should be able to get it to um, be picked up on this radio if we tune the signal generator over the IF frequency of the radio. Uh, what we'll do 
is we'll just loosely couple we'll go into the low okay we'll get into that one oh yeah there we go we'll go into the low input of the um, RF output on the signal generator and we'll just loop it round the radio like that we'll switch on right we're on internal modulation and we want to be band B there we go that's the IF so Interestingly, the IS, turn that off, but it does appear that the, um, the RF side of this uh, signal generator is actually working. There we are. But it does look like the um, RF side of it's not dead. Yeah, we're about. I think we're about there. So that's basically us just turn that radio off now. So. It does look like we do have a fault in the AF um, side of this um, radio of this um, signal generator, but like I say, it looks like we do have life in the RF stage. So it is going to need basically this thing's going to need a full um, restoration. It would be nice. Like I say I would like to get this one um, working for one simple reason. It's a it's a little bit dodgy, but I don't I don't have a nefarious uh, purpose for the use. But unlike that advance that I showed at the start of the video, the signal generator can essentially work as a small radio transmitter. In that the AF input there, um, sorry, the AF output there can also be an input. That's what this exterior and interior modulation means. Basically, if you turn it to exterior modulated like that, and you feed an audio signal into the AF there, and you set your frequency, you get a modulated RF output. Now, if we use the low output at the bottom there, and we just use a little piece of wire like you just showed me there, it's going to transmit a foot or two. Yeah, that's absolutely fine and that's what I intend to um, use it for. It would be a nice way of feeding signals to some of my um, AM radios every now and again. Um, the high output on this, the, the issue you've got really is the high, because this uses quite powerful valves, I mean uh, like I said that output valve is equivalent to a 6V6 um, and that will probably be being used to generate the RF as well as the AF. Um, like I said, I will have to dig the circuit diagram out for this so we can have a proper look at that. Um, this thing's got potentially if you put a long wire aerial on there to be able to transmit a fair old distance really. Um, I'm actually wondering why these things were really allowed in the country uh, because back when this was made um, the FCC, uh, the British version really, um, what's it? Um, it's it was it was under some weird um, department in the um, government. The DTI, uh, Department of Trade and Industry, uh, was over regulation of like radio frequencies and stuff, and they cracked down on basically anything that could transmit um, that wasn't really meant to be able to transmit. Yet these things seem to have um, crept into the country. Like I say, I have no intention of uh, doing anything um, slightly dodgy with it, um, apart from possibly using the low um, power output to 
um, modulate a signal to feed some of my um, AM radios and using it for its intended purpose as a um, signal generator but it is interesting like I said I will not now because I, I do want to get back onto the um, apricot because I really want to get that apricot up and running um, but I think we will revisit this, we'll try and figure out why the um, AF output isn't working on it. Uh, we we'll probably will end up replacing some of those capacitors, we'll test the valves in it, make sure the valves are still um, in good condition. They could pose a little bit of a problem. Um, not so much the um, output valve, because I'm pretty sure I could substitute that for various other things. But the double triode, like I said, I know it's pin compatible with the uh, like the ECC81, the ECC83, things like that. But I believe the characteristics are slightly different. And because that's being used as the oscillator, at least I, I believe that's probably being used as the oscillator in here. Um, changing that valve for something else could actually affect free... Oops, sorry about that. So, yeah, um, I've forgotten where I was say what I was saying now. Um... Yeah, it looks like we're going to have to do some working on this. Like I said, we need to address the um, faults with the um, AF side of it. Um, then we can basically check how accurate it is. Fortunately, my um, advance seems to be pretty accurate. Um, so at least we can check the uh, calibration of this off against that. Anyway, I'm going to leave this video for now. This wasn't, like I said, it wasn't meant to be a repair video or anything. It was just a, um, a quick look over this thing and then... Just a quick check to see whether it did have any um, functionality, but um, like I said when it's um, sorted out, it's going to make quite a nice piece of um, test equipment. Um, probably keep it alongside my um, advance. I've had that advance for many, many years. Um, but this is a nice, um, this is a nice addition to it. It's slightly smaller. Um, does fit on the bench a little, um, a little nicer. Anyway, so I'm going to leave it there for now. I hope you enjoyed this um, little video. So, uh, thanks for watching and goodbye.